Good morning, everybody. Michael Coburn here from Guardian Wealth. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in here this morning. Um, it's uh, just after 11 o'clock here on Wednesday morning. I'm down uh, myself here in the Wex our Wexford office here in the sunny southeast. So I hope it's a it's a fine, bright, dry morning where where you are as well. So um, this morning's presentation, I suppose, is obviously geared towards uh, accountants. Um, and it's a presentation and a webinar we've put together really based on a lot of interaction and experience we've had with accountants and our clients over the last over the last number of years. Um, and the, the I suppose the, the, the theme of the presentation is wealth extraction for company directors and really looking at the whole area of pensions and pension tax planning opportunities. So the agenda for today, um, I will try to keep it to a maximum of uh, about 45 minutes. We've a lot to get through actually. Um, and really it's around the whole topic of how can company pensions ensure business owners extract wealth from their business. Um, we also want to look at the whole topic of ordinary and special lump sum payments into company pensions. I think a um, bit of a sweeping statement here, but I think there can be confusion a lot of the time um, in terms of um, what's allowable for, for corporation tax relief and, and what isn't and, and how it's actually treated. We want to look too at the main differences between pension planning for the self-employed versus limited companies. And a little bit of a touch point here to um, actually just based on, on a number of, of cases and clients we've dealt with over the last uh, 18 months for some reason, but um, a looking a little bit around the whole area of um, what happens to a, a company pension in the event the owner and the director of the company passes away, how is their pension treated from a tax uh, perspective in terms of how it's paid out to their estate. Um, and you, it, we'll be able to show you that there, there are a couple of items uh, worth looking at, worth addressing. Um, some are kind of from a tax point or a little bit nasty. Um, and we wanna, we wanna show you a couple of fixes just in case um, you ever come up against something like that. We'll try and squeeze in a Q&A at the end of the webinar. We're a little bit tight on time, but um, I will answer the questions at the end. Anything I don't get to, we will uh, come back to you in due course as well, just with a separate email, hopefully to answer whatever your queries might be. And um, a search for uh, attendance for CPD purposes will be will be sent out to you uh, tomorrow by email. Uh, this is our, the second in our summer webinar series. Um, for those of you who were on the first webinar uh, about three weeks ago, we had um, Jim Power, just uh, I suppose giving us a bit of an economic update um, as to I suppose what's happened to the country over the last four or five months and what way the next four or five months are looking as well. Um, a little bit about our business here just before we crack on. Um, for, those, for those of you who don't know, um, Guardian Wealth was founded back in 2005. It's, um, it's run by um, myself and uh, Jim Doyle. Jim, Jim hosted the, web, the first webinar there last week. And really we focus on and have expertise in pension and financial planning for business owners. We're obviously uh, financial advisors and authorized, um, authorized brokers. And we currently advise on about 100 million of uh, pension funds um, that our clients would have with the likes of the, you know, the Irish Lifes, Aviva, Zurich, et cetera, of this world. Um, and our client base really is, uh, would be Dublin, the East Coast, Midlands, and all over the Southeast as well. Uh, and just a, a very quick note, um, a couple of people have asked me this, but our third webinar in our webinar series is on the 2nd of September, and we'll send out a separate invite for that, really looking at the whole area of pension funds and performance in 2020. So the topic of how can, co how can company pensions help business owners extract wealth from their pensions? Really, there are there are three ways of getting cash out, out, of a, out of a company for a business owner, as you will be more than aware of. Um, option number one really is, is, I suppose, the least tax efficient. It involves withdrawing funds as salary and you know, subsequently investing them personally um, in some kind of an investment product, because obviously you, you are as a business owner, the business owner would like that, that money to, to, to grow. Option number two is leaving funds in the company. Um, and then probably from there, investing them in some kind of an investment fund or product, again, to try and get that cash to grow over a period of time. And then at a later point in time, extract 
the proceeds of that through the sale of the company in the future um, on the occasion of the owner's on the occasion of the owner's exit from from the business. And option number three is this whole area of pension planning. So what we want to look at is each of those three options in turn, um, and give a bit of an overview as to the pros and cons of those, and then really delve down into and focus on option number three, which is the employer payments into pension plans and what that might look like. So uh, this is a, I suppose it's a, it's a busy enough slide. Um, but what we've given here, um, and I, I suppose I, I, I wouldn't use this with a business owner, um, but as, as a, as a, as a panel of, of accountants we have tuning in, I'm sure, I'm sure this is okay for you. Um, what we've given here is the example of a business with 100,000 in profits. Um, so let's say when I say 100,000 in profits, we're also saying that look, this 100,000 is not. Is, is not needed for reinvestment in the business for whatever reason, and the business owner has already taken, you know, um, whatever income they want out, out, of the, out of the business themselves. So this is, this is looking at the next 100,000 in, in profits. And we've, uh, we have a business owner age 45 retiring at age 60. So um, along the top of this table here, we have option one, two, and three. So option one, like we looked at in the previous slide, is withdrawing it as salary. Option two is investing it um, in some kind of a fund within the company and extracting it later. And option number, two, uh, option number three is investing it in a company pension. So if we look at option number one for a second, which as you know, is, you know would, would, would be the least tax efficient. So we have the 100,000 there. There's no corporation tax payable on that 100,000 if we follow if we follow from top to bottom here um, on that column. There's no corporation tax on that 100,000 because it's being taken out as, as income. And we're assuming at this point that you know, the business owner is, uh, is topped out at, at, um, at having to treat this, I suppose, uh, in the most penal way possibly, uh, possible uh, with you know, top rate income tax, PRSI, USC. So there's 52,000 of the 100,000 is gone and there's about 48,000 left over. Um, and then if, again, if we subsequently if we subsequently assume that you know the business owner in this case is going to uh, reinvest the forty-eight thousand um, for for fifteen years um, at four percent per annum uh, growth in whatever that fund might be, and pay some CGT at it, the, the I suppose the net what they would uh, find themselves with at age sixty is about seventy-three three thousand euro. If we take on option two. Um, that that same example on option two and the hundred thousand is left in the business, and they've decided to pay the corporation tax uh, twelve and a half thousand. So really, what they have left is eighty seven and a half thousand left in the business, um, um, but it hasn't come out of of the business. And again, we're assuming for a second that they take that eighty seven and a half thousand, and um, they invest it in some kind of a some kind of, I would say a life insurance uh, product and a life insurance fund. And they're getting four percent per annum on that, um, and they pay what wouldn't be capital gains tax. It'd be it'd be twenty five percent on life insurance investment funds, but their their you know their one five seven reduces down to one forty. So now what they have at age sixty is they have this one hundred and forty thousand in the business, and they have to get it out. Um, and if we assume just for a second that for whatever reason they they can't get um retirement relief etc on the 140,000 and they they end up looking at the most at the most penal outcome which would be a 33% capital gains tax um then really at the end of the day what they're left with is 93,841 and we're we're looking at the at the most penal um measure measure possible there so if we look at option number 3 over on the right hand side of the screen and we're looking at a hundred thousand of an initial investment. Um, no corporation tax to be paid because this this hundred thousand is going straight in, into the pension. And again, we assume the same four percent per annum growth rate up to age sixty. That puts us at one hundred and eighty thousand. Um, so now what we have is one hundred and eighty thousand in the pension. But again, a bit like getting the money out of the company, we have to get that money out of the pension. And again, for the purposes of brutal illustration here, what we're assuming is. The 180,000 under option number three um, in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, um, the, the business owner in this case is going to access a quarter of it as a lump sum, um, as, as they're entitled to do. And then the, the other three quarters of the fund, we're just assuming a kind of a, a big blowout scenario whereby 
they are uh, just going to draw it all down in one fell swoop and again suffer 52% tax, um, which is unrealistic as well. But we're, we're looking at we're looking at worst case here. So we end up with 109,000. So you can see there, and it's never an all. It's never a kind of a, a um, you know one option. Um, to the exclusion of, of all the other options. It's just a matter of looking at well, what's the balancing act. And obviously looking at it like this, uh, company pensions do actually have a role to play in all of this. Now, I know that's a lot to get through um, in one go. We will be releasing the slides um, later on as well for anybody who wants. So you can you can kind of pick pick down uh, through this, but, but really we're, we're, we're just looking at it in broad strokes here for a second. Now, what I've also looked at here is, again, it's building on this issue of realistically, would a business owner um, draw all of their pension down in one fell swoop? Well, they actually wouldn't. Um, and it's important to note that, you know, if you look at if you look at a, at a business owner, be it your clients or be it your yourselves as business owners, when you get to this point in time, um, that as you know, you know, when you kind of get into your mid and late 60s and um, the over 65s live in a slightly different tax environment than everybody else. So it's 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 more realistic to say that on the drawdown of the pension, once the lump sum is taken, the balance of the pension just wouldn't be taken in one fell swoop. It would be actually spaced out as income over a very long period of time. So the actual tax burden is an awful lot less than that than that kind of brutal approach of of drawing it all down in in one go. And again, I've I've looked at this in terms of giving a couple of examples as to, well, what might, what might the actual tax burden be on a pension? Uh, so if we follow it from start to finish to say that a business owner has put money into their pension, it's, it's, it's grown to a certain level. What might the actual tax uh, income tax burden be on that pension if it's drawn down at a sustainable level over a very long period of time? So uh, we have a couple of, of kind of what ifs and examples here, but I'm, I'm just going to focus on, on two, of, uh, two of them here for a second. So if we take the example here, um, the second row down of, 200, of a 200,000 euro pension fund. Well, as most of you will be aware, it's, it's possible to get a, a quarter of, of the pension fund down as a lump sum. So here's our, our 50,000. So we've no tax liability on the 50,000 lump sum. So then we have the other three quarters of the pension fund, which is the other um, 75%. And if we assume that at least in the very early stages, there's no requirement to draw down out of that of, out of this, this three quarters out of this retirement fund. There's no requirement to draw down a huge amount of income from it because why why would a why would somebody do that if they already have a have a big lump sum sitting in the bank um, from uh, which is the tax free cash piece. So if we assume that premise for a second and we say and we say that well look. Um, this person is only going to draw down the minimum 4% of their retirement fund that they're legally obliged to, to draw down, which would be six grand. And then if we say that, okay, well, what other income have they got on top of this 6,000? Well, if we assume for a second that we're talking about, you know, um, husband and wife um, and two, two, two state pensions, we're looking at a total income of about 30 grand a year for somebody kind of um, in their late 60s and, and onwards, which again, you know, would be lit, little or no income tax. So it's it's not necessarily true to say that okay you know I have my pension, um, but you know when I draw it down I'm going to get crucified for income tax. It really does depend on a lot of other circumstances and whether whether an individual maybe has rental income or or something like that is 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 building over time or is is being is being paid in conjunction with um, with the pension income. And again, even if we look at a, an even larger pension fund, and if we take the example here of a larger pension fund, maybe of eight hundred thousand. Well, we have a lump sum entitlement of two hundred thousand, which is a, you know effectively a net lump sum of two hundred thousand. So we've no tax to pay on that. And if we assume again for a second that we have a four percent income obligation to take from our retirement fund, which is the other seventy five percent, so it's four percent of six hundred thousand, that comes to about twenty four thousand a year. Um, and again, if we assume two state pensions on top of that, we have 48,000 a year and the income tax burden on 48 grand a year for somebody in their late 60s and onwards, which you know, was the bones of eight, nine, 10, 10%. So really, if you look at it from start to finish to say, well, extracting money from the 
company putting into the pension and then looking at the drawdown from from the pension the tax burden if it's done correctly at least might actually be be um be quite low there also is the added implication and advantage i suppose in terms of the act of extracting money from the business and putting it into a pension aside from the tax efficiency um considerations monies in a in a company pension are actually protected um from creditors so if the company gets into trouble at least the cash is out of the company if the individual themselves get into gets into some kind of financial trouble uh, pensions are actually held in trust so the the company owner typically might be the trustee of their own pension but they as trustees have a legal obligation to protect the assets the assets in the pension for 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 the for the beneficiary which you know they can have two hats on they're 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 the beneficiary of the pension but they're also the trustee of their own pension so it's it's aside from any other consideration it's a way of i suppose protecting cash for for that just in case um scenario um which brings its own rewards and and benefits as well i'm just keeping an eye on an eye on time here so if we've established let's say at least pensions have a role to play in terms of extraction uh, of cash from from a business i think where a lot of the confusion may may be um, and this is is from talking to a lot of accountants over the years is um okay but what are the rules in terms of what the what the company is allowed to claim in terms of corporation tax on the on the pension payments from the company into into the pension on behalf of the company owner and really, I suppose it's about understanding, and I'll give you an overview of it here and the implications of it, is what are the limits to annual pension funding? And there are limits to annual pension funding. Um, and really, it, it boils down to it's, it's, it's a function and it's a, it's, a, it's a formula. And the formula really is based on the age of the individual in question, what their gross earnings are um, from, from the business, their marital status, um, the date they started with their employer, um, in which case, you know, the, the point at which they, they registered their company and started taking a salary, the value of any previous pensions, and the value of any current company pensions. So all of those factors are, are, are thrown into the mix, and there's a formula there, um, and there are, you know, I've, I just took the example on the screen of a couple of, of sorry, of a pension fund calculator, um, and um, it's, it's you, you, you throw it all into the calculator and it gives an answer. So what I'm going to do here is to show you, um, based on this uh, Joe Bloggs, um, born in January 1975, um, started his business five years ago. He's married. He has 60,000 per annum of earnings, planning to retire at age 60. He's 100,000 currently in his pension fund. And he has a defined benefit pension from previous employment of about 10 grand a year. Um, so based on those, those factors, let's have a look at what kind of pension funding is actually possible. And this is where it can get a little bit confusing. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a bit like that. Uh, I think it was a Jennifer Aniston um, shampoo ad a number of years back is, you know, here, here comes the science bit, but here comes the science bit. Um, there are different types of categories of pension payments, and they are uh, what are called future ordinary contributions, special contributions for past service, and then matching ordinary and special contributions. So it's not surprised that people get confused because um, um, you know they all kind of sound alike. Um, but I'll talk you down through what the differences are here. So number one is a future ordinary contribution. So based on the factors we've looked at in terms of Joe Bloggs' age, et cetera, et cetera, um, it means that his company can, can make um, a, an ordinary contribution of 57,000 a year into his pension for the next 16 years, okay? 57,000 a year. So in terms of what's allowable, that's what's allowable. If Joe Bloggs in this case decided, you know what, I've actually more cash in the company, I would really like to get more of this cash out of the company and into the pension fund. There is, and I'm going to skip down to number three here for a second, there is what's called a matching ordinary and special contributions, which really mean that 
um, it's possible to put in a one-off special contribution, in this case of 53,000, and, and a regular annual ordinary contribution of 53 as well. So really what we're saying is we can't do 57 a year, but we can do 53 of a lump sum and 53,000 per annum for, for, from, from there on. And then we have category two, which is a special contribution for past service. So a special contribution for past service um, really is in recognition of the fact that based on um, the value of the pension fund as it currently stands and all these other factors we've spoken about for, for Mr. Bloggs, um, his pension fund is actually probably not as full as it should be because he has underfunded it in terms of what he would have been allowed to do for the last num number of years. So it's a bit like being allowed to make this special contribution for past service because the, because the pension has been underfunded for, for a period of time. So what that means is there's, there's an actual, in recognition of that fact, there's a maximum special contribution allowed of 109,000 and then a reduced ordinary contribution per annum of 50,000. 50, which means that we have the option of a 57,000 payment in, the, in, in one year, a 107,000 payment in one year, and 159,000 of a payment in one year. So um, um, depending on what it is you're looking to achieve, it's actually to, possible to get three, three different figures. But there are implications from a corporation tax relief point of view as to when, how, and how much of those respective three um, contribution figures into the pension, um, when and how that corporation tax relief can actually be claimed. So hopefully you're all with me so far. Um, so the, the, the notion of the future ordinary con contribution, um, relief is always available in the year the contribution is made. Okay, that's quite simple. So the future ordinary contribution, 50, 57,000 a year, Relief can be claimed in that year, it's, and you know, fifty-seven thousand is made again next year. The relief can be claimed. The and I'm going to skip down to the bottom one. The matching ordinary and special contribution um, relief can be claimed on the ordinary contribution and the special contribution in that year. So this fifty-three thousand lump sum and the fifty-three thousand per annum um, there on in that can be claimed in that year. So what we're saying is. The relief on the 107,000 can be claimed um, in that year. So really, the, this issue of having to roll forward some of the relief that you can claim relates to um, it relates to these special contributions for past service. So when it comes to special contributions for past service, the relief is available in the year in which the special contribution is made if if the special contribution is less than 6,350 um, of a payment, or if the special contribution is equal to or less than the corresponding annual contribution made. So if we look at it here, we're saying that this 109,000 of a payment, because it's not matching in terms of the amount, the 50,000, and because it's not under the, the 6,000 uh, um, um, allowable figure, we can't claim relief all in one year on this 109,000. So how, how has that actually worked? Well, the special contribution for past service and the future ordinary contributions works out like this. So again, we have the ordinary contribution of 50. We have the special contribution of 109, so we have a total of 159. The ordinary contribution of 50, we can claim relief in the year that that's actually paid. But again, as we've referenced, the special contribution of 109 is greater than the ordinary contribution. So the tax relief then on that must be spread forward. So how is that actually spread, spread forward? So what we do is we look at the value of the special contribution for past service, which is 109, and we divide that by 50. And we divide it by 50 because that's the value of the ordinary contribution. And that gives us um, a, a factor there of 2.18. And we're allowed, we're, you know, and then we're allowed to kind of round up. Um, if it's under 2.5, we can round it down to two. If it's over 2.5, we round it up to three and so on. So we're looking at rounding it down to two. So really what we're saying is this 109,000 of a special contribution is divided by two. So it's 54 and a half 
50,000. So what that means is in year one, we can claim relief for the 50,000 ordinary contribution, and we can claim relief for 54,500 of the special contribution in the first year. In year two, we can claim relief for the remaining 54,500. So really in this, in this example, it's spread out over two years. So it's, it's just a matter of, of calculating what the special contribution might be and working it out accordingly. So it's, once you know the rules, it's actually relatively straight straightforward, um, but it does get missed. And I have seen a lot of instances whereby accountants um, um, really kind of aren't, in some cases, 100% sure of what way to treat it because the, the business owners themselves really, you know, they've written the check, they've sent it in um, to the insurance company or to, to their advisor, but they're not really sure, well, how much of this is an ordinary contribution, how much is a special and so on. And in some cases, it's not even looked at um, and sometimes is, is picked up by, by revenue at a future point in time if you're looking, if you're looking at, um, at an audit si situation. Hopefully that made sense. So we're going to move on now to looking at some of the differences between pension planning for the self-employed and limited companies. And I can see a number of questions coming in already. Um, so I'll try and address some of those at the end at the end of the webinar if we have a little bit of time. So anybody who's just, as I see it, has sent in a question, I will get to them. And if not, I will email you back um, directly. So the main difference, so we've looked at, a, a, again, an example of case study here of Brian, who's uh, working hard from home i suppose as the as as a lot of us are at the moment just based on the on the picture there although his his house is an awful lot quieter than mine so brian is 42 he's an it contractor um earnings of 100,000 a year he's reviewing his options in terms of how to organize his business um you know should he remain self employed should he should he register um and set himself up as a limited company and really we want to look at this from the point of view of which route um, is the most advantageous in terms of wealth extraction and, and actually holding on to that 100,000 that Brian has actually made. A bit of a table here again. Um, so again, if we, look at, if we look at the summary table of the wealth extraction options, and if we just pick the first, the first row there, so Brian is self-employed, uh, he's no pension, he's made 100,000. Um, and roughly his income tax liability on his 100,000 is about 38, 39,000. He's not making a pension contribution. So his net income is 61,489. So he's managed to hold on to 61,000 of his 100,000 of earnings. So he's managed to hold on to 61% of, um, of the wealth that he actually created in that given year. And maybe just, just to roll it on for a second, let's say he is self-employed, stays self-employed, he has gross earnings of 100,000, um, but he makes a pension contribution to a personal pension of 25. He gets the tax relief on that, so his, his tax liability falls to 28. Do you know, overall, his net income then is about 46,000, plus the pension contribution that he actually has now on his pension. Um, so he's about 71,000 of wealth extracted from his hun original 100,000. You know, it's in the form of money in his pension and it's in the form of net income. But he's managed to hold on to about 71% of his 100,000 that he's actually made. So if we look at Brian, if he had his business set up and he had a, he had his company set up, um, you know, um, could you doing it that way and looking at a little bit of pension planning, could he actually hold on to more of that wealth even, even again? Um, and I'm just going to take the bottom example here for a second. So again, he's he's made 100,000. Let's say he he only pays himself fifty because he doesn't he doesn't need to pay himself um it just based on this example he doesn't need to pay himself his hundred thousand he needs to pay himself fifty so the tax he's going to pay on that is about thirteen thirteen thousand and with the other fifty he puts that into a pension fund because we've looked at already maybe that actually might make a bit of sense when you extrapolate out that out um in terms of corporation tax relief in terms of extracting money from the pension and also in terms of um you know the net effect of tax income tax liability he might have on that pension money at a future point in time so if he has a pension contribution of fifty thousand, um as in the company has made the contribution so his net income is about thirty six thousand. um but he also has fifty thousand in his pension so he has 80 he's managed to hold on to eighty six thousand of the 100,000 that he actually made in the first place, which is, I suppose, really him holding on to about 86% of this 100,000 that um, he actually made. 
So there can be uh, definitely a case, certainly for Brian in this case, of not just in, uh, um, you know, setting himself up and incorporating and, and running his business as a, as a limited company, um, as, um, but also, you know, incorporating some level of pension planning in, into the mix there as well. So um, I just have another example. The reason I've put an example in here, it's um, kind of not related to limited companies, but it's something we've we've seen and and um, been involved in um, where appropriate. Um, and uh, because we we do have a number of clients who are GPs, and obviously there are issues in terms of incorporating for a GP. But we've looked at uh, we have a case study here of John and Mary, um, obviously looking very pleased with themselves. Um, drinking wine at half eleven in the morning is never a good idea. Um, but so John is John is fifty six. He's a GP. I'm being slightly sexist here and assuming that John is 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 the GP. Um, he has GMS and private practice income. Mary fifty three um, um, helps in the running of the practice. Not formally registered as an employee or paid a salary, but does help in the running of the practice and does have an active involvement in it. So what we've done here is looked at the opportunity maybe to formally employ Mary in the business and how would this impact this whole issue of wealth extraction from what essentially is their business. So quick run through again here, if John has net earnings from the business of about 200,000 euro, and let's assume that he makes his maximum pension contribution of 40,000, so he reduces his tax bill to 74, um, so he has, he has his net income there, what he's gotten into his hand, um, of about 85,000. He's also managed to put 40,000, excuse me, 40,000 into his pension fund. So he's managed to hold on to about 125,000 of his 200,000 euro pension, uh, or sorry, his 200,000 euro that he actually made, which is a function of the net income and the money in the pension fund. So about 62% uh, uh, um, about of the wealth extracted from that 200,000. Let's say, if because it's the right thing to do and it's appropriate because Mary actually is working in the in the practice and um, um, is contributing to the success of the business. So let's say there's uh, net earnings in the business of 200,000, but in this case, Mary is on salary for 30,000. Let's, let's say we push it out, we push it out even further and uh, John as the employer is making an employer contribution for Mary of 50,000 into, into a pension fund because he can do that as Mary's employer. So if we look at, you know, the, the net earnings for John then are reduced to 120 because he's, he's, he has these expenses of, of the 30,000 salary for Mary and the 50,000 is gone. Um, so his net earnings are 120. And then he makes a pension contribution himself of the same 40,000 for his own pension. So, you know, overall his tax bill comes down to 39. So the net income that John and Mary are, are I suppose, are, are getting out of this is about 70,000, which for the purposes of argument is perfectly fine for them in terms of what they need to earn to um, to to run their life and um, and do the things that that they want to do, but now we have we have ninety thousand of it inside inside in the pension. So if we if we add up the net income that they've gotten and the pension funds that they have accrued with those two contributions, the total wealth extracted is about one hundred and seventy thousand of the two hundred thousand. So just l at least considering that kind of a measure um, and maximising what's actually there, we're looking at, um, you know, where, where it's just John and John alone, he's managed to hold on to 62% of his 200,000 wealth that he has created for himself versus employing Mary because it's appropriate um, uh, and funding into a pension for Mary as well. He's managed to hold on to about 80% of the 200,000. So it's certainly, um, it's certainly worth considering. Many of you may be doing it already. Um, um, for for your clients, um, but it's I think it's good to hammer home that point sometimes as well, and make sure that the, maybe that the pension contribution is being paid as well. Um, again, conscious of time here, um, there just one little, um, and again, trying to make this as relevant as possible. Again, something we've we've looked at for a client over the last number of years. Again, uh, we're looking at obviously I've changed the name and the face here. This is Paul who um, looks like he got, a, he got a professional to do his headshots, absolutely. So Paul is 59, and really what you want to very quickly look at here is the whole issue of, um, 
the whole issue of um, somebody who's coming to the point of exiting their business and let's say for the sake of argument um, that you know they're going to max out on retirement relief or entrepreneurial relief or whatever it might be um, and they have cash in, in their company and they're, they're looking to get it out um, or maybe they're not qualifying for the reliefs or whatever the situation might be. It's What I want to look at here is what might be possible as a kind of a literally as the day before um, Paul's Paul's exit from from his business. So Paul already has a pension fund worth worth a million. He's done very well for himself. He's a salary of 100,000. And um, the company has, you know, a, a huge amount of cash. Um, and it's looking at, well, how much of this can we get in, in, into the pension fund as a kind of, as a, kind of a last minute? Um, so based on those factors, and again, it's looking at this issue of, you know, what's the maximum amount of funding? So based on those factors, which are Paul's age, um, the size of ex his existing fund, you know, his retirement date, etc. cetera, um, it's possible for the company to make, again, going back to this issue of the special contribution for past service of about 1.1 million of a lump sum in literally the day before Paul exits his business, it's possible to write the check make the payment um, into into the pension fund. Um, now the company is is not going to be able to claim relief for all of that obviously in one year, but purely as a cash extraction measure, um, it still might make sense um, as part of an overall package and looking at all the options available. So you know, you know, Paul leaves the business on a Friday, the contribution is made on the Thursday and he turns around and accesses his pension um, the following Monday or Tuesday morning. So it's it's a it's a it's a kind of a it's a kind of a a very quick win that's actually available. So we've we've looked at a at a lot, and I'm conscious I've I've thrown a lot at you, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm I, I want to give you as much value as I can in these in these 45 minutes. What I want to actually look at, and again, it's it's come up a few times. It's actually come up for a client of mine in the last six months, um, and I think it's worth knowing because an awful lot of business owners, number one, mightn't be aware of it, and yourselves as accountants, be it it's your own pension funds or your clients, you mightn't be aware of this as well. And it's this whole issue of, I have a, 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 for example, I have a company pension and my company is funding into my pension. Um, what happens if I pass away uh, prior to retirement age? How is my pension paid out to my estate, to my spouse? And the major watch point here is in the event of death for a company pension, and if this death occurs before retirement, the way a company pension is paid out to a spouse or next of kin is actually, um, it's it's not pretty. It's paid out as a as a maximum lump sum of four times, uh, um, four times that the deceased salary, with also a refund of a lump uh, as a lump sum of the employee contributions and any AVCs. Now, I suppose the first point to note here is the majority of company director pension schemes. It's the company is making the pension payments. So there are no employee contributions in AVCs. It's usually 100% employer paid. Um, so I've, I've worked an example here. So if we have a fund value of 800,000 euro in a company pension, and that's 100% employer paid, and this person passes away, let's say in their 50s, um, and uh, in terms of how that pension would be paid out to this person's spouse, it's a lump sum of four times finals of four times salary. And if we assume that this person was taking 50 grand a year of salary, that's a lump sum maximum of 200,000. That's fine. But then we have the issue of the 600,000. So what happens to the 600,000? Well, under revenue rules, the 600,000 must be used to purchase an annuity income, in this case for the deceased spouse. So if we assume that the deceased is a female age 50, again, I'm being slightly sexist, so apologies, but if we assume the deceased spouse is age 50 um, and the investment amount is 600,000, and this actually is a, is a reason I've picked a, I picked a female age 50, is a, it's a case of, of actually seen um, and, and dealt with. This 600,000 um, is converted into an annuity payment um, an annuity, and what's an annuity payment? An annuity payment is, a, is effectively the insurance company in this case, keeping the 600,000 and giving the, the spouse a fixed income for, 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 the rest, for the rest of her life in this case. 
And annuity rates are pretty appalling at the moment. Annuity rates are especially appalling um, if, if you're younger. So for a female age 50, uh, um, at the moment, the annuity rate would be about 2.6%. So that's, that's you know, 600,000 times 2.6% which gives an annuity income per annum of about 15,500. And that's a fixed 15,500 for the, for the rest of this person's life. So, you know, if you look at it, that person is going to have to live to be aged 88 years of age to get the full value of that, of that annuity. And it's even worse than that, again, really, because the annuity income is assessable for income tax. So depending on what else, what other income that they might have, they might end up even losing some of the 15,600 um, in, in income tax. So, the question is, look, that's not great. Is there a way around that? There is a way around that. Um, and really we're looking in, in the event or if it's a circumstance whereby a business owner dies very suddenly, so it's a heart attack or it's the, you know, get hit by a bus or a car crash, there is nothing that, that can be done because it, it, there's no planning that can be done to get over that. If, however, it's the circumstance where a business owner um, you know, goes to their GP, their consultant, and they get some bad news, um, um, and they're looking to organise their affairs just in case. And again, I have experience in this. Um, it is possible to transfer the pension benefit. A number of things can be done, but one of them is that you can transfer the pension benefits from the executive company pension plan into what's called a personal retirement bond. So it's just a different pension vehicle. Why would you do that? The reason you would do that is if in the event of the subsequent death of somebody, of that person, monies in a personal retirement bond are paid out as a tax-free lump sum, in its, in, sorry, as a lump sum in its entirety. So if it's going to a spouse, obviously it's tax-free. So it gets, it gets rid of and blows this whole issue of the annuity income completely out, out, out of the water. So if you have clients, um, or even a few yourselves, uh, if there, if, if there are, are, are accountants who are, who, are, who are tuned in here, who are business owners, and you're in that circumstance, that is definitely something I would be, I would be doing and advising on. Or even if you have a business owner and they, for whatever reason, they have an amount of money in their pension fund, and um, they've decided that, look, you probably actually no more, I won't be putting any more money into this fund from here on in. It would even make sense at that point to transfer this, the company pension into a retirement bond for even, so that might even protect against this, you know, the, uh, against the sudden death, which is, you know, the heart attack or the, or the car crash, et cetera. Um, it, it can lead to issues in terms of if they want to turn the tap back on again and start putting money back into the company pension fund, but there, there are ways and means around that as well. So it's certainly, it's certainly a, a something worth knowing to be able to keep in mind for yourselves and to to advise your your clients as well. Now we are bang on about forty five minutes. Um, so I see uh, I have a lot of questions coming in here. There are about fifteen or twenty of them actually um, from about uh, forty odd uh, attendees, um, and I'm just looking at them here. They're they're kind of grouped into into various categories here. So um, what I'm going to do is I will look at them a, kind of in groups of categories and I will, I will kind of answer them in, in, in turn and I will send an email out to everybody just with the question and with the reply to, to the questions as well um, in the next, in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then if anybody has any further, further questions, absolutely pick up the phone or, or email me back and um, we can give you a little bit more, more clarity on things. Um, so um, that is pretty much it. I know I've raced through an awful lot. We're, we're trying to make these these webinars kind of uh, a little bit of a kind of a, a short, sharp shock of of of, in, of information. Um, but we are available if anybody has any particular questions, queries, or comments. Um, you can um, email us back at the, the registration link would have come out from. Joanne here in our office, so certainly you can email Joanne back and it will get to me. Um, we have our webinar number three um, coming up on the 2nd of September, and really it's it's looking at the whole area of pension funds and performance in 2020, kind of what has happened, what has happened to pension funds, what are the challenges for pension funds, and the importance of investment growth and how to get it over the next couple of years, because again, we're joining up the pieces of the puzzle here to say, well, look, do pensions have a role from a wealth extraction point of view? Arguably, they actually do. The next step is to make sure that the pension fund is growing, number one, but it's also 
protected as well in the event in the event that um, that um, we have another period of stock market volatility. So that's all for me. Thank you so much. A uh, bit of a whistle stop tour there. Um, questions, comments, uh, definitely welcome. And uh, I hope you enjoy the sunshine. I think I think the rest of the week is supposed to be pretty good. So wherever you are, I hope you're getting plenty of it, be it in the office or be it working from home. Um, any, uh, see a number of people here actually tuned in from uh, Leash, Offley and, and Kildare. So um, I hope everything is going okay for you. And um, certainly we're all, we're all uh, in the same boat, I think, here. So thank you very much. And we look forward to talking to you soon.